How you going guys? I'm Dean from Blog for the Blood God. And I'm Lee from Bloody Rush Studio. And we're here with an Adeptus Victorium battle report for you that's going to incorporate a few elements of Corn Berserker Tactica. And in addition, we've got the brand new Drakari Codex and the special edition one at that. So we'll be doing a short review post battle report and just discuss the, the way the units have changed and what we like and what we didn't like and yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing this. So I only literally just picked it up this morning. So um, I might be a bit rough with it. Feel free in the comments below, tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> uh, feel free because I will probably get things wrong, which I pre-apologize for. Yeah. But that's part of the fun of playing with a new codex. Sounds good. All right, let's jump straight into it. Let's do it. Here we go, guys. I'll go through my list first. Nice and simple. So we've got a World Eaters Battalion led by Khan the Betrayer himself. In my second HQ slot, I have an Exalted Champion, just basic weapons, no upgrades. And then in my three troops slots, I have all Corn Berserkers. So there's one unit of 18, and then two units of six. In each unit, there's a champion with a power fist and a chainsword. And in each unit, there is a Icon of Wrath for the reroll charges. And then every single Berserker has a chain axe and a chain sword. Then I've got a fast attack slot, which is my Charybdis Assault Claw. And dedicated transports, I've got two Rhinos. In addition to that, I have a Supreme Command Detachment over in the right-hand side there, which has got a Sorcerer with a Jump Pack and two Renegade Commanders. Now, I know you're probably saying, oh my god, Sorcerer in a Corn Army, but the, uh, the narrative to it, the fluff I do, is he's like a Blood Priest and he's a demonically possessed Berserker who encourages the Berserkers to hit harder and fight faster, which is like what I represent with the Psychic Powers. Um, yeah, so that pretty much rounds out my list, and we'll jump over to Lee, and he'll run you through the new Drukari. Alright guys, welcome to Drukari in 8th edition. So, uh, this might take a little bit of explaining to go through the list, and just some of the things that we have, so um, feel free to bear with us while I go through it, and just uh, hopefully you enjoy some of the close-ups of the models. So, first and foremost, we've got the three uh, patrol detachments to try and uh, benefit from the rules where we're going to get the extra command points. So, um, basically what we do have is a Carbolite detachment, and then we have a Covens detachment in the middle, and then we also have a uh, Witch Cult. So, that way we um, manage to get the extra uh, command points, and um, yeah, so we'll start off with essentially seven, but I've already spent a few on the list to try and get a few more. So... To begin with, we've got the Cabal of the Flayed Skull. Now, what that um, allows us to do with that obsession, so obsessions are new things that come with the uh, well, the Drukhari uh, list, and their obsession is uh, giving plus three inches to models with a fly keyword, and then also reroll ones of uh, rapid-fire weapons. So the reason why I've taken this is that the two squads of Carbolite Warriors, as you can uh, see to the left of screen, or the uh, close-ups, uh, sitting in their Raiders with a Splinter Axe, reroll ones, and any rolls of sixes will generate two hits. So these are the new uh, gunboats, essentially. So I really want to give them a try, and uh, that's essentially what we're doing. And then we've also got the um, Archon with his uh, Husk Blade, and he has the Warlord trait known as Famed Savagery. So that gives him, if I remember, uh, strength and attacks characteristics by one in any turn in which they are charged, were charged, or make a heroic intervention. So, um, yeah, he, I don't see him getting in combat too much, but, however, with the uh, Carbolite Warriors as well, if their Raider gets destroyed and he's hanging around, he's still going to give them the reroll ones to hit, which is really, really cool. All right, next, moving on to the Witch Cults, which is on the right. Um, apologies, I've only got a um, Hecatrix acting as my succubus because I am just bought a new one, and I will be painting it up. However, I'm taking uh, the Obsession Cult of the uh, Cursed Blade, and uh, with their Obsessions... It gives them, if I remember correctly, it's plus one strength. So uh, having all witch units with uh, plus one strength, especially on the big Helion Bomb unit there, they're going to be going up to strength five base. And then uh, when we have a look at the start of the battle and I roll up the combat drugs, I'll probably choose plus one strength on the um, uh, Helions, or I might even just give them the plus one attack because they're already needing threes to wound against the Corn Berserkers, and then give the uh, witches the plus one strength. So it might uh, benefit them a little bit more. Uh, the Succubus only has a um, Agonizer, and Treacherous Deceiver is her Warlord trait. So Treacherous Deceiver gives us... 
Each time you roll an unmodified saving roll of six for this warlord in the fight phase, the enemy unit that made that attack suffers a mortal wound. So I'm guessing she'll be in combat quite a lot. She'll be taking a lot of saves. Uh, any rolls of six, that does a mortal wound back, which is good for knocking down Dean's Corn Berserkers. Finally, we also have the Prophets of Flesh in the middle. So uh, this is essentially what the army's uh, based around. So I've got Urien Rakath, who we'll go with in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Four Grotesques, three Talos, Kronos, and the Rax in a Venom. So basically, uh, what he, what Urien will be doing is just adding his uh, plus one toughness. And then with the uh, Prophets of Flesh, their um, obsession allows them to sensible to pain to four plus so tell us with the four plus save and then um their uh six up um uh essentially the old school feel no pain they're going to be pretty hard to remove so also plus one toughness yeah it's going to be a really tough nugget to crack there so yeah there's a lot to go on with this um uh new drakari codex there's a lot we're going to be talking about in the game but uh yeah it should be a lot of fun so i guess next we're going to be going on to the mission Alrighty, so here's the table that we're playing on. We've finished our objective marker placement. So we've got objective 1 up in the top right corner there. Objective 2 is almost in the center of the table. Then objective number 3 is over in the breached section of wall up the back there. Objective number 4 is at the gate. Objective number 5 is directly underneath the blood waterfalls down the front left corner. And objective number 6 is up near the blood waterfalls in the top left corner. So that's our objective placement. For our mission, we're playing a Maelstrom of War game called Sealed Orders from the new chapter approved book. Well, relatively new. Um, and basically in this one you place your six objective markers and at the start of the game both players generate six tactical objective cards that they keep secret from their opponent. And then at the end of your turn if you have at the start of your turn, if you have no tactical objectives remaining, you generate new ones. The first time you generate new ones, you generate five. The second time you generate new ones, you generate four, so on and so forth. And in this mission, you uh, keep the tactical objectives secret. So the only way to discard your cards is to either achieve them, or at the end of your turn, you can discard one. In addition to that, there's a stratagem that's one CP, and you use it at the end of one of your turns to discard up to three objective cards. Uh, so that's the mission that we're given in playing. And for the deployment type, we're going to do Hammer and Anvil. So that's up on the screen now. And uh, yeah, we're going to start deploying. Alrighty guys, so we've just finished our deployment. I'll run you through mine first, nice and simple. A couple of berserkers in rhinos here, units of six, unit of six in a rhino. And we've got one renegade commander up here, just about to jump up onto objective two. And then another renegade commander here, ready to jump onto objective number one. And then for Lee's deployment, he's significantly more on the board. He's got uh, his Talos, he's got his characters in there, he's got his uh, grotesques. He's got his Helions up along here, creating a bit of a screen to protect his gunboat. He's got a Venom holding objective six. He's got his Raider over here. Or Ravager? Raider? Raider. 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 I got it no right. Ravager in this list, sorry. Uh, and then he's got these guys holding objective number five here. Um, so, in addition to that, I have a Charybdis full of 18 Berserkers, Khan, and my Exalted Champion, all in deep striking. And I also have a Sorcerer with Jump Pack up in Deep Strike. And Lee has... What have uh, you got? Ten Witches and the Succubus in... Uh, in the, the Webway. webway. Alright, so we're going to roll off to see who gets to go first. I obviously had uh, less drops, so I got plus one. Alright, Lee, what do you got? Two. Oh, it shouldn't be hard to beat a two, surely. Six. Ugh. So I'll take first turn. Well... And the uh, question is, do I want to take first turn, or do I want to give you first turn? No, I'll take it. I'll take okay, it. Well, let's we, see if I seize. Let's see if he seizes. Good luck, Lee. Oh. No. <laughs> All right, so turn one goes to the corn. 
Alrighty guys, so I have drawn my secret six tactical objective cards. Lee's just over there, so I'm not going to read them out to you, but I will show you what they are. So, that one should be relatively easy to get. Uh, once again, that should be relatively easy to get. Uh, possibly in a later turn. Uh, oh, that one's going to be tricky. That'll be quite tricky to get. Uh, that one should be nice and easy. And that one should also be probably quite tricky to get. So I think this turn I'm going to go for that, that, and that will be my three goals for this turn. And then I'll see about these ones later. Alright, I'm going to sit them right there. And no peeking, Lee. No peeking. Wait, shut up. Alright guys, so we've just finished my uh, movement phase. So as you can see, we've had the um, the Renegade Commanders have moved up onto some objectives, into some forward positions. The Rhinos both rolled really hot for their advance rolls. They rolled a 5 and a 6, so that got them all the way up onto this objective number 4. And then the mighty Charybdis has jumped down. We've had Khan, all of the Berserkers, the Exalted Champion who is up here, and the Sorcerer all arrive. The sorcerer deep strike independently, and they've all come in right next to this big blob of meat for them to rip apart. So what's what's the bet thing? What's the bet at the moment? So uh, the 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 bet that we've had is that all of that shit is gonna die. Everything you can screen, see on screen, with the exception of the character in the center, is going to die this turn. Well, two characters in the center, the Archon and Urien. Okay, I'll uh, I'll decide which one gets the axe in a, <laughs> in a moment. We'll, we'll have that conversation. Uh, but first things first, I'm going to cast Warp Time, which is a Warp Charge 6. And I rolled a 9, so that goes off successfully. You don't have any psychers, do you? Nope. Nope, so no chance to deny that, so they'll get to do a move. And I'm also going to cast Prescience, which is Warp Charge 7, which goes off as well. So I've got Prescience and Warp Time, so I'm going to make another move with those Berserkers, and then we'll jump into the shooting phase. Alright, so that goes my shooting phase. So pretty much all we shot with the crew to Storm Launchers, down into the Talos here, and we managed to take off a few wounds there. Uh, and then other than that, pretty much everything, this, the Bolt Pistols, Khan's Plasma Pistol, all fired into them as well, just to sort of soften up that unit, so that when the Berserkers make their charge, they're more likely to gape them. Um... But yeah, so that's the end of my shooting phase. Let's jump into the charge phase. All right, we're going to roll a charge range for these Berserkers. They've just survived with not a single casualty from Overwatch. And we're looking for a 3-inch to make it into the uh, Talos. But I've charged everything there except for the Archon. I'm going to let him live. So let's roll this charge. We got a 6. I'm going to spend 1 command point to re-roll that 2. And turn it into a fucking one. <laughs> so, still still enough to get me in, but not quite as big as I was hoping for. Alrighty, so now we've moved in the Berserkers. Now we're going to roll Khan's charge range. Push them over. Uh, I have noted that I've got a Berserker here who's to maintain the six-inch range of the Exalted Champion's bubble. So he's still within coherency there, but he's um, back to get the bubble. And now we're going to roll. We look for a 9 on Khan. That's a 4, so that's a fail. And then the Charybdis is also going to need a 9. That's a 10 for the Charybdis, so the Charybdis makes the charge as well. Alrighty guys, so I just used one command point to give my Berserkers plus 1 to wound by using the Veterans of the Long War stratagem. And uh, Lee decided that he wanted to use the new stratagem in the Drakari Codex, Agents of Vect to deny me use of that stratagem. Uh, so basically he has to roll a dice, and on a 2-up, my power is denied, uh, but I get the CP back, unless he rolls a 6, in which case it's denied, and I don't get the CP back. So we rolled the dice, we thought we were doing it on camera, but I'm a dickhead and forgot to hit fucking record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he rolled a 1, which means he fails, um, and then he used a command point to use the command reroll stratagem yes. to reroll that 1, and he rolled a 4. So the end result was I got my CP refunded, so I, I'm back up on five command points left. However, 
my stratagem doesn't go off. It did, however, costly four oh. command points just to pull off that one stratagem. So we'll see whether it was worth it. I think it was a waste, in my opinion, but Lee sticks by his decision. So, Well, I'm thinking with those uh, Toughness 7 um, Talos and uh, Toughness 6 on the um, uh, Grotesque, uh, needing the 5s to wound now is going to be a little yeah. bit more of a hindrance because 4s come up quite a lot in rolls. Uh, yep. But we'll see how it goes. Yep, all right, let's get it done. Alrighty guys, so we're about to throw six Corn Berserkers on their second round of attacks into Urian. We're titling this portion of the video, The Death of Urian. <laughs> so we're hitting on twos because I got off Prescient. So we're removing anything that's not a two or higher. Pretty good. That's pretty good. And then we're wounding on four because we're strength six, but um, Urian's toughness six, and we denied my um, veterans of honor, so we're looking for fours. I told you it was useful, guys. And I get reroll wounds from my dark, uh, my exalted champion. So, that's not a four, that's not a four. Thank you for rerolls. Get those out of the way. Yeah. Success yes, successfully wounded. Yeah, that was bad. Okay, right. maybe it's not the death of Urian. Let's see, four ups though, so here we go. So we got a four up save. Six there, so failed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh. And then you got a six up in a pain. Ooh, here we go. Lots of sixes here. Need Ding. to roll three sixes in this, otherwise he's dead. It's gonna happen. One, oh, two. two. <laughs> I want to spend a command point to have a crack. So you really want to spend a command no. point for a one in six? No. No, he can go. Oh, oh, I oh, oh, oh. CP re-rolled in my charge phase already. Charge oh no, that was in phase. charge phase. Yeah, yeah five phases nah, different. he can go though. He can go. Alrighty, he fantastic. So that, my friends, is the death of Urian Rakath. Alrighty guys, so here we have the end of my fight phase. So... As you can see, the Berserkers minced all the Talos. They minced all of the racks except for this one bloke who's got four wounds left. No, can't have four wounds left. They only no, start he's got, with uh, like two. He's got two wounds left. Two, yeah. um, so nearly wiped out that entire unit. Killed Urian, as you saw. Uh, and then we managed to pile in around this uh, Archon in such a way that he can't fall back in his turn which then means none of this is going to be able to shoot into the Berserkers. So they're safe. Um, and then in retaliation, Lee managed to kill five Berserkers. So not a bad counter-strike, but uh, not quite enough. And then as for objectives, I'll just do a recap of those now. All right, guys, so here we have the six objective cards that I had from the last turn. As you can see, I secured objective one, over here with my champion, so I get that one. Uh, area denial, score one victory point if there are no enemy models within six inches of the center. If there are no enemy models within 12 inches of the center, get D3 instead. So I'll get D3 for that because Lee's still in his deployment zone, so in theory couldn't be out of it. So we'll roll that D3 now. One victory point, whoop de fucking do. So that's two cards. Uh, Master of the Warp, score one victory point if you manifest or deny a psychic power in your turn, so I get that. Uh, I also get Assassinate, score one victory point if at least one enemy character was destroyed during your turn. So I managed to get that, and I have these two to hang on to. I'm actually going to voluntarily discard this one here, which is objective number six. So now I just have this one card left. Alright guys, so beginning of the Dark Elder turn, here's the cards, so I'm going to give you guys a look at these first and foremost, so we've got that with that, so that's going to be interesting, we'll see how that uh, pans out. Uh, next up, this, this one, this one, this one, and this one so it's going to be quite uh interesting to see what happens um i don't know how we're going to go doing these but i think there is a way around it but uh let's see what the dark elder do in their turn one 
Dark Elder turn one. So uh, basically what we've done here is uh, move the Helions up. So with their combat drugs, they've got plus one uh, attack. So basically with their uh, obsession, they go plus one strength, so strength four. Then with the Hellglaives, they're plus one um, strength from that as well. So now plus one from the combat drugs. They've got lots of attacks coming in to try and mince up the rest of those Berserkers because that Berserker bomb is scary. Uh, the Kronos has moved up. Archon's obviously still there, can't move out. Uh, Raider has moved up, ready to start uh, popping some Dark Lance around the place. Venom has also moved up, and this uh, Raider has also moved up. So we're going to start bringing some of our uh, Lance weapons to bear. And then all the way in the back corner, the Witches and the Succubus have jumped out of the uh, webway, ready to maybe do some damage here. So it's going to shape up to be a very interesting shooting phase for the uh, Dark Elder, but we'll see what happens. All right, guys, and a quick recap of the shooting phase, because everything's either in combat or in um, uh, vehicles. Only two wounds have gone off this Rhino, and that is it. So uh, let's go straight on to the combat phase. All right, team, so let's have a look and see what happened. So with the mass amount of attacks... Uh, Dean with uh, 37 attacks or hits from the or 37 attacks from the Helions causing 20 wounds uh, all up. Dean uh, passed. It was 20 was it? hits. 20 hits. 16 yeah. 16 wounds, and then of those 16 wounds, I passed 14 free up armor sets. So um, yeah, that kind of put everything in a bit of a, a tailspin. Then two command points also interrupt. Uh, which meant the Archon and the um, Grotesque didn't get to go. Uh, pretty much killed them. And then when they get to go a second time, killed off all the um, Helions. So, yeah, basically did not go to plan at all. The Kronos also failed his charge, so um, that meant he didn't get to jump into combat and do anything at all. So, um, coming over here as well, these guys rolled a double one and I think a five to charge. So, yeah, things just didn't work out for the Dark Elder at all or the Drakari in their first turn. Um this happens in games, so I don't think it's anything reflective of the Codex just yet. I think it's just uh, how the game's kind of panned out. But we'll see what objectives we actually scored this turn, though. All right, guys. So first up, these ones automatically have to be discarded because they cannot be done anymore. Uh, that was going to be a bit of a waste. Which are? Uh, which are, let's go back to them, priority resorters received. So I no longer have a Warlord to achieve the... Uh, oh, yes. Thing. So they automatically get discarded. Uh, this one here, uh, not achieved this turn. This one here, not achieved this turn. I'm noticing a bit of a theme going on. Uh, this one here, also not achieved. However, theme. this one here, secure objective one, oh, I said that out loud, not achieved. <laughs> <laughs> But however, secure uh, objective six was achieved, so um, we're good to go on that one. So we did score at least one point in that turn, so there we go. All right, on to the World Eaters turn two. All right, guys, before I jump into my turn two, it's also worth noting that at the end of Lee's turn, I managed to get defend objective number four, which is right here. Lee has nothing denying me, so at the end of the two consecutive turns, which is my turn, his turn... I score that, which means I have now scored all of my Maelstrom cards, which means I get to draw a fresh five. Alrighty, guys, so I've just drawn my fresh five cards. So I've got this one here, which I think should be relatively easy. That one should also be pretty easy. That one, yeah, maybe, probably not. That one, very easy. And then I've got this one here, which I might as well say it out loud because Lee's going to want to know what the fuck's going on. So I've got priority orders received. <laughs> so basically I generate an additional tactical objective, but only my warlord can achieve it. And that additional one is such. <laughs> and um, not entirely likely to happen. <laughs> So, uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I fucking hate that objective. <laughs> Priority re order received. Fucking only your warlord can get it and he needs to kill fucking three units. It's like, well, okay. I guess I'll go fuck myself then. Uh, anyway, so that's my secret objectives for this turn. And we'll uh, jump into my movement phase and be right back. 
Alrighty guys, here we have the end of my movement phase. So the two rhinos that were in the middle here have split. One of them's moved over here to get objective number two. The other one's moved up here to get line breaker. The berserkers are still inside. Then we had our Khan, the sorcerer, and the champion have all just moved up to keep that central um, position held. This renegade commander's moved up into the center, and this renegade commander has decided to stay on objective number one, even though those witches are bearing down on him. Then we had the Charybdis, who's moved from his central lo location here over to this way so that he can charge these two vehicles and also hit them with his flamer attack. And the Berserker Blob that was in the middle there has moved across this way so that they can engage with this vehicle. So it's going to be a pretty messy turn, hoping to do some serious damage here. So we'll jump into Psychic Phase and we'll be right back. Alright guys, we just finished my shooting phase. So the crib just fired its Flame Pistol uh, and did a single wound to the Venom and then uh, three wounds to the Ravager. Uh, and then Khan fired his Plasma Pistol and took another two wounds off of this one. Uh, in the Psychic Phase, the Sorcerer used Warp Time to throw Khan in even further and failed to prescience when he tried to roll it onto those berserkers there in the shadows. Uh, so that sums up my shooting and my psychic phase. Now we're going to jump into combat. Alrighty, there we have the end of my fight phase. So uh, the berserkers managed to mince the vehicle, rip it apart, and then well, how many of them died? Four of them? Four. <laughs> Four of them died from the explosion, the um, dudes inside. Uh, and then the berserkers pinned around them, wrapped around them and pinned them. Uh, Khan charged the Kronos and did two rounds of attacks. We did 14 attacks and he failed to do a single wound to the Kronos, which is fucking depressing. But that's Khan, <laughs> that's Khan for you. He ain't what he used to be. Uh, and then the Charybdis flew in here and blew up that uh, Ravager. So looking pretty good for uh, me. I'm in a pretty good position. We'll go through my cards now. Alright, so here's the objective cards that I had this turn. So I had secure objective number one, which I get over here with my uh, brave little character here. I also got secure objective four, which I got up in the center of the table. Uh, I might get that later. Psychological warfare, I didn't manage to get. And the other one was the priority orders received, which I had to kill something with Khan's pistol, which I didn't manage to do. So I'm actually going to voluntarily discard that one, just because it's dumb, uh, and I'll hold on to these two. Uh, so yeah, that's my turn. Alrighty guys, we're partway through Lee's turn two, and Lee, I believe yes. you have something you'd like to say. Yes, I think I will concede at the end of this. <laughs> Not much I can really do, um, I can score two other points. Uh, that's about it at this stage, so... Um, so just to give yeah. you a bit of a recap of the, uh, the battlefield, so Lee has... Uh, these warriors, which are going to die in his assault That's phase. exactly it. Uh, he's got one Kronos there who's severely surrounded and is going to be taken out pretty soon. Uh, he's got some stuff over on this side of the board, which could maybe... Like, I'm not going to table him, you know, but the chances of him being able to claw back a victory when I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven victory cards, which is the only win condition in this game... And I'm about to earn a couple more. And also, obviously, I'm going to continue to generate more and more points. And his ability to catch up is significantly hurt. So I, I think that's a fair... Yeah, I think we'll just save everyone the time and pain. But we'll go through the um, tactic, I think, for how the uh, word bearers work. Because I thought that yeah. was... Word bearers? Um, word oh! Bearers. <laughs> the, uh, word well leaders. leaders. Well leaders, word bearers. It's the same to me now. <laughs> All right. They're red. So yeah, so the next part of the video is going to be a real quick tactica on the world eaters. And I'm going to show you how I use the berserkers to pin his arc on. And the way that you can use that to prevent your combat units from being shot in your opponent's turn. Uh, it's a really powerful strategy. I'll go through that in a moment. And then we'll do a quick recap of just what Lee's thoughts are of the uh, Dark Eldar Codex, the Drakari. Because as you know, he's played it in a few battle reports, so he's very familiar with it. And uh, we'll just talk about what he's excited about and, yeah, what he's looking forward to trying out in future battle reports. Alrighty, guys, I'm just going to show you a real quick strategy on how you can use your combat models more effectively and pre prevent them from being shot down in your opponent's uh, shooting phase. So the example that I've set up here is a formation that's very familiar to anyone who's gone up against a Gilliman gun line 
Tau do it often. Uh, Adeptus Militarum do it often. The Mechanicus do it often. Um, and the yeah, Dark Elder are probably going to do it. So there's a lot of different armies where this is going to be effective. And what we've essentially got is a, uh, a castle or a castle of Daka, just any old shooting. So we've got a couple of uh, Ravagers here full of warriors. We've got some warriors along the front here, and then we've got some kind of buffing character in the middle there that gives them all rerolls or whatever. And then most people, what they'll do is they'll take a unit and they'll create a screen like this, which they're using to try and push your deep strikes out further. They might use rangers for this, they might use crude, they might use scouts, they might use nerglings. There's a lot of different things that people will use to try and screen you. Um, and that's general the formation that a lot of people will use when creating a gun line. They might use rattlings as another example. Um, and what a lot of people do is they take their deep striking close combat threat, whatever that might be, in this example, we're going to use berserkers. Berserkers are the best for this specific purpose, but what they'll do is they'll disembark, they're nine inches away, they'll warp time in, so that they're now only three inches away, like so, and then they'll charge that unit at the front, the screening unit, and kill it. Oh shit, breaking my own stuff. They'll charge that unit and kill it, right? So then what happens is basically after you two rounds of attacks, these guys are now dead, I'm breaking that again. Um, and then your berserkers are here. So for this example, let's assume that they've put a, a, more than a six inch gap between those two units so that you couldn't pile in from there into those because berserkers obviously get their consolidation and then a pile in. Uh, so assuming that they've, they've screened correctly, you've killed their screens and now all of that is going to open up and shoot all of your berserkers dead, right? Which now means that you're in a really bad position because they're able to eliminate your threat. So the way you do it to prevent that, there's a few different ways that this works. Um, but the easiest and simplest one is to say they've set up like that. You move in, you warp time in so that you're three inches away. And then when you roll your charge, you roll, say you roll a seven, an average seven, you actually just put one guy in, and then these guys, you make sure that they're within two inches of him to maintain coherency, but they're not within one inch, and they're not within one inch of any enemy models. And you just move them as close as possible, so they're like one inch and one millimeter out. And basically what that now means is that in, um, in the fight phase, only this one berserker in the center is eligible to attack. So none of these guys can attack and none of these guys can attack. And let's just say that one berserker kills off two. Probably pretty reasonable. Your opponent moves these two. Doesn't really matter. Then what you do is you go, okay, now I'm going to pile in. So you pile in, making sure that you still stay more than one inch away. And the only stipulation for, say, these guys piling in is that their pile in move has to end closer to this model. So the guy that was here can pile in around and you go okay I've done my pile in moves and then you go okay now I'm going to do my consolidation moves so you move him around again around again he has to end closer to him so he goes to there so you've done your second pile in moves and once again none of these guys are eligible to attack neither are these guys so he would have done another round of attacks he might have removed one or two models these guys meanwhile would have been piling in around this way so your opponent can't really stop you from doing that. And then at the end of combat, once you've done all of your attacks, you pile in around one model like that. And what this does is it means that during your turn, yeah, you didn't kill anything. You didn't get any kill points. Who cares? Because now what happens is in his turn, he can't. none of this can shoot you because you're engaged in combat. And this guy can't fall back because you haven't left a gap big enough for his base to fit through. So unless he has the fly keyword, he can't get out. He's stuck. Which then means your opponent, with all of his DACA, is effectively neutralized. And then, in your opponent's phase, you now attack with fucking everyone. You throw all these berserkers in, and you annihilate that squad. Which then means in your turn, all of this is still alive in your turn too, and is now free to engage 
with the rest of his army. So that's the, the idea is basically you intentionally don't kill the thing that you charge so that you can wrap around it, pin it in place, protect yourself from shooting, and then you kill it in their turn. Like what we used to do in 7th edition, you'd always try and kill your opponent in their turn so that you were free to act in yours. Um, there's a few other ways you can do it, depending on how your opponent sets up. And there's a few things they can do to try to stop that. Um, let's just say he didn't have screens. All right, so he's got nothing in there screening him. He's just got, he's got Gilliman, and he's got his gun line, and he's got his Razorbacks, and his whatever. What you do is you charge in like so, and this is actually preferable, because what you do is you then go, I'm going to allocate, I'm going to charge, declare a charge against these guys at the front and the two tanks, but not against the character. And if you don't declare that you're charging it, you can't attack it. And then what you do is you basically you charge in full hog and you wipe out all of these guys. You want maybe wipe out one or two of those. And then you pile in around the fucking possum on the roof. Uh, and you pile in around and you pin that character. And because you did not declare that you were charging him, you can't attack him. And therefore you can't kill him. And therefore you can pin him in place. And then if they had more stuff somewhere, or maybe they've got some stuff that's going to drop pot in or deep strike and do damage to you that way, because you've been able to pin that character, they can't shoot you. So that's just a little sneaky trick that you can use to try and uh, make sure your berserkers live a little bit longer. And you saw it in effect in this battle report when I charged in against all those Talos and Grotesques and all that sort of stuff. I intentionally didn't declare my charge against the Archon so that I couldn't kill him, so that I could pin him, and then all of his transports weren't able to shoot my berserkers. And that strategy pretty much won me the game. Because if I hadn't done that, he would have just killed all of those berserkers and I would have been pushing shit uphill. Uh, yeah, so we'll jump over into Lee now. He's going to give us a quick recap on the Dark Elder Codex. And uh, then we'll call it a night. Alrighty, guys. Had a great battle with Lee, testing out the new Codex. What are your thoughts, Lee? Uh, well, I thought that game probably wasn't the best to exactly test it out. Because um, uh, I just tried a little bit of everything, not going for a super competitive list. Yep. Just wanted uh, to see what we could do. But um, having that... Uh, Carbonus with the Berserkers drop out, that's just way too intense, yeah. you know? Full disclosure, this is a, uh, a tournament list that I've been writing for an upcoming event, so I was trying to go pretty hard while still being, being relatively narrative by including things like Khan, who's not exactly optimal, but doing things like warp timing, a Caribbean full of Berserkers. So my list is pretty hardcore. Yeah, so, yeah. My, mine was pretty pretty soft, and um, I was trying to try <laughs> try a few different things, just see how they work, but I mean, it really didn't get the option to try it. I had a few uh, bad card draws as well to yeah. uh, force my hand into doing some things. But, it's kind of um, hard to um, to get an accurate representation of what Dark Ola models can do on the table when they all die. Like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't really get to see, especially the Talos um, and, and the Grotesque, so you know, it would have been good to do that. And I'll probably misplay a few things in that game a little bit as well, especially in the competitive sense, but um, you know, it was just yeah, just a game to test out. But yeah. overall, I think um, when I start playing a few more, I think this Codex has actually been quite good when we start figuring out what it can do. Yeah. Well, um, um, one of the things that I noticed, like I haven't had a really detailed look at it yet, which is what, obviously why I wanted to get your thoughts, mm. but um, just the points reductions on some of those really clutch pieces of war gear, like the heat yeah. lances getting cheaper, it just makes so many units that weren't viable at all, potentially viable. Yeah, and that's one of the things, like I, I love the heat lance as a weapon, um, especially, you know, when I saw it come out for 8th edition, I thought, oh, this is fantastic, but when it was 25 points a hit, that was what, expensive. 12 now? 12 points, it's yeah. Le it's more than a 50% discount, that's fun. you can't ignore that. That's... You can't, you know, and especially with um, how some of these other cult obsessions and other things work, um, you, you're going to have a really good time with the heat lances, and, yeah. and I want to start employing a few more things where I can play with it. Like, you can't do it with the scourges, though, because they don't benefit from the obsessions, unfortunately. Yeah. But still, and 12 points. Some of the obsessions are really good. Like, what was the one you had the plus one strength to all the units? Yeah, for all the... Uh, it's the... Let me just quickly re read it. It's the witch it was cult. plus one strength, and when they fall back... And they only lose one model. one model. That's an amazing fucking trait. If I could put that on Berserkers, fuck yes I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, Cult of the Cursed Blade. So you increase the strength characteristic to models of this obsession by one. In addition, a unit with this obsession fails a morale test. Only one model must flee. Yes, that's fucking crazy. So, Especially when you put that on witches and you can give them an additional plus one strength from their combat trucks, yeah? That's exactly it. So, so yeah. 
and that's yeah, that's really good. There's some really cool stuff in there. I don't think they have anything that's like Pox Walker broken. Like they're not gonna you're not gonna see Dark Elder top three you know, at every event, you know. But I think uh, I reckon, stuff... I reckon yeah, there's gonna be some stuff that people are gonna start thinking about and unlocking. It's you have to change the way I think um, Dark Elder how they were working to how they're going to work now, especially yeah. with uh Running multiple detachments, as we all know, most uh, tournaments set, tend to limit your detachment count. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think they're going to have to change that because the Dark Elder aren't really going to benefit too much at all if you don't get to do that. So, you know, you're only going to be running either just Carbolites or just... Um, that being said, they're so. only fucking six points of pop now, yeah? Come, oh, yeah. It's like 300 of those in a list. Yeah. <laughs> Good you luck. can do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking good luck. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, one thing I'm definitely going to be doing is playing a hell of a lot more games. So I've got um, quite a lot of painted models, but I do have to paint more now due to all the uh, point reductions, which sucks because I've got so many other things oh. to paint. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. Uh, oh no, I have, to, I have to add more models to my army for the same amount of points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it takes forever to paint yeah, shit. So, you know, so you do it to your standard. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't um, have enough time in a day, God damn it. So, you know, but I, I really want to try out some more stuff with um, multiple Venoms with the Carbolites running around in there. Uh, big Blob of Witches as well. That's another thing I really want to try. Maybe running a, um, an attachment with uh, three um, uh, Ravages as well. That's something I really want to try because that can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's heaps of cool stuff I want to try, which means heaps more shit I've got to paint, so, yeah. you know. One of the things I'm really looking forward to digging into in a bit more detail is the stratagems. Mm. Like, Lee, show me, he's got the, uh, the tactical objective deck, the data shit cards. Yeah. It's a stack like that big of just pure stratagems. That's it, and I... Like, there has to be some gold <laughs> in that pile. So. That's it, I only got this book literally probably about two or three hours before I came around to play this game, yeah. so... <laughs> I, um, didn't get a chance to really study or understand the stratagems. I watched a few of the other reviews online, but they just didn't sink in too much to go, out. Oh, this yeah. is the perfect time to play this, so... I think, from what I've seen online with the leaks and stuff, the stratagem where you can spend three CP to deny your opponent the stratagem that they just used. Mm. Uh, Lee used it in today's game, and after the game we had a bit of a talk about it and thought, well, it ended up costing him 4 CP, and my Berserkers ended up mincing the things that they attacked anyway. So even if I did not get did get the plus one wound, it would have been pretty much the same net result. Mm. So I think a lot of people are going to fall into that trap. Yeah, They're going to feel like they're pulling a gotcha when they're going, aha, I'm going to take away that stratagem that you, you want, but they're actually probably wasting their CP by doing so. Yeah, so, it's, it's going to come to the right time to choose it, the right sort of situation as well. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to do it in this game so people could see it work. Mm. Um, you know, and it didn't work all that well in this game, especially when you fail the, the roll, you roll yeah. that one. So, that being know. said, I think it's one of the healthiest things for the game simply because it curbs a lot of the really high end competitive lists because if they run into them, <coughs> they're in trouble. Like a Poxwalker army, if they run into this and you can shut down their stratagem their whole fucking list falls apart. Yeah, and I love using that strategy. I love using Pop Walk yeah. as well, which I'll be um, so, taking to your tournament, actually. So yes. um, <laughs> it's um, going to be a hell of a lot of fun. Just even little things like, you know, the spending that stratagem to prevent people from being able to, like, advance and charge. You know, yeah. stuff like that. So they go, oh, I'm going to advance, and then if they go to charge and you use to see people, now they're not charging you anymore. Like, that can be game-changing in certain situations. Yeah, I, I can kind of see it working in those late game clutch situations. Like, yeah. I always come, because I, I tend to play middle tables in tournaments, so I'm never at the top end or the bottom end usually. It's always in the middle. And I always find those games tend to come to that sort of, you know, Hail Mary move, because everyone wants to try and pull that win. Yeah. Spend that command point to play that strategy, to do that thing, and then it just doesn't work when you play this. As long as you've got enough command points left. I like but to see, if somebody uses that strategy, if you're Dark Elder versus Dark Elder, yeah. and you use the strategy, and then they use their... Fuck you, you don't get your stratagem. And then if you use your fuck you, you don't get your stratagem. Does your initial stratagem yes. go? I'd say so. Yeah. Because you're stopping the effects of them stopping the effects of you. That that's in so <laughs> that's like, agents of vector, the agents of vector. It's like playing three reverse cards on top of each that's, other. Yeah. <laughs> reverse draw four. That's a wild card. <laughs> But yeah, but as I say, no, there's going to be heaps of really cool things to unlock in, in, in this codex yeah. and really delve into it. And, Let um, us know in the comments below what you think is going to be fucking awesome in the Dark Elder Codex. Because you guys have probably seen some stuff that we haven't even had a chance to delve into yet, so mm -hmm. I'd like to see what your comments are. And uh, also let us know what Dark Elder units or Drakari units you'd like to see tested in future games, because we might be able to work something out where we can we can test a full witch army or full full rax army or or a full fucking whatever. 
That's it, guys. Let me know. I'll, I'll. If you let me know, I'll paint it. Yeah. Put the pressure on me. That's what I need Just to get this stuff done. Every single person go over to Bloody Brush Studio. <laughs> Go onto their Facebook and put a <laughs> comment saying, Lee, get this shit done for the next battle report. Just flood his Facebook with those comments and you'll have no choice. If you do it, if, if you ask, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> but ask nicely, please. Yep. <laughs> Alrighty, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Lee. No worries. Good game. You jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll uh, see you next time.